Then we have another one here. Another one said, verse 20, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. <laughs> you know, in Israel there was a law that a man was excused from going to war when he had taken a new wife. And we always find at wartime there's increase in marriages and the birth of children. I'm not drawing any inference from that and just saying that happens to be a fact. But this man, I think, had the weakest excuse of all. Why didn't he just bring her and come on to the dinner? You'd get a good dinner. Natural affection is what our Lord's talking about. These are the three things that are keeping more people from God than anything else. Possessions, business, and natural affection. How many today are being kept away because of a father or a mother that is not interested in the things of God? Somebody says, well, you know, Brother McGee, that I have only one Sunday with my family, and I want to spend it with them. Believe me, that keeps a lot of people from coming. Now, all these were excuses, and you can classify every excuse under one of these heads. I do not believe that I've ever heard a legitimate excuse. Men make excuses because the real reason was they did not want to come. What this first man should have said, excuse me from looking at the land. I can't do it today. I've got to go to church. The second man should have said, I can't look at these oxen. I've got a dinner engagement. And the third one said, wife, come on. I've got a wonderful invitation. I want you to share in it. And by the way, you've got an invitation, friend. I Forgot to tell you about it, but I better tell you about it now. And that invitation's an engraved invitation. It's written in the blood of Christ, and it's to come to the great table of salvation. And by the way, if you reject God's invitation, he has to reject you. Listen to verse 24. For I say unto you that none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. That's a severe thing, is it not? Now we have here, again, verse 25, "...and there went great multitudes with him." I've mentioned that before. "...and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father..." In other words, it's to put him first. All terms which define the emotions or affections are always comparative. And the believer's devotedness to Christ should be such that it looked like everything else would be hate. This is what he's saying here. Then he tells about the tower, verse 28, "...for which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish." May I say to you, you ought to make a decision for Christ, but you ought to think it over, friends. Now you have the parable of the king who's getting ready to go to war. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000, or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an embassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Now, you can be saved by just accepting Christ, but my friend, you'll never follow him and you'll never serve him until you're willing to make a sacrifice. That's the thing that he's saying here. There's a difference in being a disciple and being a believer. A believer should be a disciple but unfortunately, they all are not. Now we come to the so-called parable of the prodigal son. And we'll see in a moment why we say so-called. The background was that the publican sinners came in to hear him by the multitudes. And the Pharisees and scribes began to murmur. Why, they say, this man will receive sinners and he eateth with them. And he did that, by the way. I can't resist telling the little story about the girl from the slums of London. One night she slipped into a church, and she heard the pastor read this 
verse here. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And she came up afterward and said to the pastor, she said, I didn't know that my name was in the Bible and that God mentioned me. And he looked at her. She's just like a little waif and rags. And he said, Why, well, young lady, I don't think you're mentioned in the Bible. Oh, yes, said, you read about me. And he said, Where? Why, you read where it says that this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them, and my name is Edith. May I say to you, that's one way, but certainly he would receive Edith also. And he'll receive Mary and John and all the rest of us. Thank God for that. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Now we come to these parables that he gave in answer to the murmuring of the Pharisees and scribes because he was receiving publicans and sinners. And he spake this parable unto them. Now this parable is actually in three parts. We call it the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son, but actually it's just one parable. When I was a boy, I used to go visit my aunt especially at Christmas time, and there'd be other visitors there, and they always put me up in the loft, you know, up where she had everything stored. And they put me a bed down up there. And at Christmas time, that always was a very wonderful place for me. The chimney came up through that. It was warm. But going up the steps, there was a picture there that she apparently had had in the old days, but had removed it. And it was what is known as a triptych. Do any of you older folk remember triptychs? Well, a triptych is a one frame but three pictures in it. And this one was of the prodigal son. It showed first the prodigal son in the middle as he came home. That's the great thing. One on the other side shows him going away and having a high old time. And the one on the other side showed him down in the pig pen. The center one, though, showed him going home. It told the story. Well, what you have in the three parables here, so-called, is one parable, but it's like a triptych. There are three pictures that give the message. Now, let me read the first one. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you have a hundred sheep? If he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find him. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Now what you have here is, first of all, picture of a lost sheep. And the shepherd here is the one we think of as being the great shepherd. He's the shepherd of the sheep. We are his sheep. And here this shepherd had a hundred sheep. One of them got lost. Now that, frankly, would be a pretty good percentage if you started out with a hundred sheep and you came through with ninety-nine. But this shepherd wouldn't be satisfied with just ninety-nine. When this one sheep got lost, he went out and looked for it. And you notice what he did? He put it on his shoulder. He's able to save to the uttermost. And he'll go out after it and put it on his shoulder. And you know, the children of Israel, their high priest, had on the garment, one of the garments that he wore, a garment that had two stones, one on one shoulder and one on the other. He carried the children of Israel on his shoulders because there were six names on one shoulder and six on the other. And our great high priest, he carries us on his shoulder. We won't get lost. When he starts out with 100 sheep, he always comes through with 100 sheep. And as far as I'm concerned, that's all predestination ever did mean. It just means when this shepherd starts out with 100 sheep, why, he always comes through with 100 sheep and not 99 sheep and one goat. It's always a hundred sheep. This is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ going out looking for those that are his own. 